the night Hey guys and welcome to another video in my ongoing EQ and mixing tutorial series. There's some videos up already, more to come, much much more to come. Check out our channel for the videos that are already there on this topic. Um, okay, now this is this Daisy Daisy song. I did a mix of it in a previous video and that mix was more procedural, tidying up, because it's a very rough 12 track recording, right? So the first mix was tidying up and getting things organised, right? And so to, to kind of get the mix a bit under control. But now I've moved on to the next level, which is getting into the actual mixing more, right? Giving it character, deciding on what it should sound like. Um, now I'm going to show you the things that I've done. Just quickly, right? Now the first thing is I did some flex work. Flex, if you don't know it, it's the thing inside Logic that allows you to adjust the timing of transients in audio. Now, what was happening, a lot of the time, the drum was coming out of the big fills late on the kick drum. So I've used the flex to correct that. Also, I've used flex to correct where the bass was coming late sometimes and to tighten up the bass, right? Just in a few spots, particularly after fills, right? And then here, in this part of the song, there's a massive fill and the whole band was coming in quite late. You could really hear it. Diddle, 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 uh, late. So I chopped across all the track files, took some of the front off and moved them all up a little bit to close the gap. Then I did some more flex work. So now the fills, they're not perfect, but at least every fill comes in on right on the money. Diddle, 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 boom, right on the beat, right? Okay, so that's the first thing I did, some tidying and tightening up, right? of the timing of things. Now the next thing I did is I've used, I've replaced some of the Logic native plugins with IK Multimedia 
plugins which are emulations of classic bits of gear, mostly EQs and compressors, which are these these emulations from IK Multimedia. I've got to tell you, they're absolutely amazingly good, and I'm going to do a whole video on those as a product, right? But I'm using them in this because they do have a character you don't get from the native plugins in Logic, right? Now, so that's the that's another main change. I'm using these specialist plugins. Right, so what have I done? Well, let's start with the bass. Apart from the, you know, I did all the flex timing tightening, right? Um, and then I wanted to sort of decide what character the track would have. So, first thing, the bass. Now, if you listen to the bass, the bass player is not playing with a pick and he's not playing really tight and staccato. He's not going like really tight. He's playing finger style and, and the, the notes are blah, 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 smearing into each other like this. It's not super tight. So if I tried to put the bass into the mix as just a straightforward bass, it was smearing too much. It's too muddy. It's not defined, not going bum, 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 really tight on each note. The, the bass player is letting each note sort of sustain into the next note. So putting it in as a general bass wasn't working. So I thought, okay, what am I going to do? I've got to treat the bass more like a guitar because he's playing it, letting each chunk... Um, sustain into the next chunk more like a rhythm guitarist would do so this is what i did the bass if you remember was recorded to two tracks okay that doesn't mean the bass player played twice recorded twice the bass player recorded with the band once but they split the signal and recorded it to two different tracks okay so what i've done is on this track i put a logic guitar amp this preset brown stack crunch which is a distorted uh, sound. I think I drop the mids and I push the treble up. That gives this bass track some distortion, an amp grind, right? Then after the amp, I'm putting it through one of the IK Multimedia t rex plugins that I was talking about. This is a, a, an emulation of a, an API 650 graphic, and let me tell you, these APIs <laughs> in these IK Multimedia plugins are, like all of them, amazingly good. Don't let the simpleness fool you. As I say, we'll get to a review of all these, right? And what, so what I'm doing with the graphic is I'm notching out all the upper and lower frequencies and only letting through 500 hertz, 1K and 2K, just the mid, right? And those frequencies are boosted a bit. So this, when the amp comes before this, so I'm getting this real honking British 70s punk mid-range grind off the bass. It's more like a grinding baritone guitar. Well, it's not, but it's like a real grinding, almost stranglers um, uh, bass tone, right? Real grind, but it's got no bottom end at all and no tops above 2k okay now the other bass channel is different on this i'm using still the straight logic eq and i'm cutting everything out in the mids and the top and all the rumble off the bottom with the low cut and i'm just focusing in on slightly above 100 hertz tight quite tight and then after that eq the signal is passing into another one of the IK Multimedia t rex plugins. And like all the others, this one is amazingly good. This is their emulation of an SSL 4000 channel strip, which you can switch between black and brown knob versions, right? The black knob version has tighter Q. And that was a, that was a change they made um, for George Martin, um, the Beatles producer who suggested that. Okay, so you can have it in either mode tighter or, or wider cue and other there's other subtle changes now i'm using this really mostly for the bottom end and the channel compressor because the ssl channel compressors has a beautiful glue quality right so the channel compressor is really clamping down on that signal <laughs> but it allows it still to have some um dynamics right you really hear the do 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 of each pluck but it's completely controlled in terms of its level 
Mm. And then what I'm doing is down the bottom here with the black knob version, I'm giving 2.6 dB of boost at 104 hertz, about the same as the frequency on the, the Logic EQ. Just to reinforce that bottom end more, but the SSL adds some nice coloration in that bottom end a little bit, right? So it's good. it gives it a really nice warmth. And I'm scooping out the mids further with both mids. I'm scooping out at 0.3K, which is 300 hertz. I'm dropping that quite a lot by minus 9 dB, and I'm dropping out at 2.2K by minus 8 dB. So I'm scooping out the mids more on here. Nothing happening at the top end. So it's just this base emphasis removing the mids even more, and the channel compressor. But overall, because it's passing through the emulation of the channel strip, it's giving it a character as well as what the... the it's not just about the fact that I'm giving it some boost with the bottom and scooping the mids and giving it compression. These all add character. They've got a certain character, right? So that gives me a really warm, rich bass, but with no mids really, or they're very controlled mids. The emphasis is on a rounded, nice, warm bottom end, but you can still hear some high-end stuff at the top. That thinner edge of the pluck, right? And when you combine that with the grinding mid-range guitar going through the amp and the graphic, the two sound like this. Yeah, that's so this gives me the grind, this one gives me the grind, and this one gives me the boom. And together, lovely jubbly. There, now this defines my sound. I'm going for this sound. Okay, I wanted this nice growling bass, but with a nice bottom end, so that it was more like a... It's got distortion, and, it's, and it helps to remove that up and down quality of the bass not plucking really tight. Um, and gives it some character. It's got a grind in the mids now. But still a nice bottom end, tight, right? Now, the guitars, the two guitars, they, they pan one left, one right, and look on the EQ, there's nothing happening except for the bottom cut that I put on, on at the beginning of the first session, the low cut. So no EQ on the guitars on their individual channels. They're just panned left and right. But the right-hand guitar, I'm putting it through, again, the wonderful API 650 graphic, notching out the bottom end, notching out the high end, and just focusing on the middle, from 250K to 4K. And I'm giving it some preamp drive, because this emulation is not just about the em emulating the graphic and the way it responds, uh, and incidentally, the 650 graphic has proportional Q. The more you boost or cut, the tighter it gets on the band. But I'm employing the preamp to get some emulation of the of the of the preamp that was in the in the APIs, which has its own character. That gives some edge as well. That's giving it some grind as well. But it's subtle, right? So that's making this guitar far more mid-range with no bottom end. And, and the real high tops taken out as well. And that's panned to the right. And then the other guitar is just bog standard as it was recorded. No EQ except for a bottom cut, which is just getting rid of any really, really bottom end rumble that you won't hear, but might be muddying things up. And if you listen, the way this guitar is recorded is quite scooped. Yeah, it's got a nice warm bottom and bass and a grinding higher top, but the mids, the, the high mids, and, and the, the, you know, around 1, 2K, dead and, and sort of down to 700, 600 hertz, so they're dropped. So it's, it's quite scooped. Now, when you combine the two, already the panning effect, panning one left and one right quite a bit, introduced a nice pan spread. But it, that's even emphasised more now because the what your brain is telling you, the one on the right has got this mid-range emphasis. The one on the left is scooped and that adds an even more sonic character to the pan of the two because they've got different frequencies on the, either side of the pan. This has got the body and this has got more of the mid-grind. So that kind of gives it a lovely spread across the speakers emphasis even more. Okay, and then both those guitars go to the group bus, right? Which is yep, here. 
Now on the group bus they arrive here together, still you know on their relative pan positions left and right. This is a stereo bus. Oh, that's the bass, sorry. Guitars here. And I'm doing further EQ on the group bus. Scooping down those mids just a little bit, just to make it a little bit less honky on the mids. <laughs> But still, you've got the more mid-range grinding one going to the right, and the more the more scoop one going to the left. And then on the channel um, before the EQ, I'm putting a because it used to have a channel, a Logic channel compressor before the EQ, right, to keep it all to glue the two guitars together. But I'm using this emulation from IK Multimedia, their T-Rex White 2A, which is an and it is a really, really, really good emulation of a classic Teletronics LA-2A compressor, right? Which was an optical va and valve combination compressor. There's no threshold, there's no attack, there's no release. It's program dependent, right? But it this just brings the guitars to life. It really does. I'm giving it quite a bit of hammer, right? Take it out and listen. Yeah, it's really giving them a lovely um, dynamic edge, right? Then it goes into that EQ where I'm just tweaking the tone a bit, right? So it's not overly mid-ranged emphasis uh, across the whole stereo width, but there's still more mid on the right guitar than the left, right? After that, then it finally goes into this Neve. Now this is another T-Rex EQ, and, and again, like all this, all of their all of their um, emulations, this is so on the money. This is a classic Neve 1073. I'm using a little bit of the Marinier preamp gain, which just gives it a little bit of it's hard to describe some some edge with harmonic content that's subtle. Okay, and then all I'm doing is I'm just giving it a little bit of lift at 360 hertz, just a tiny bit of lift. A little bit of lift at the on oh, this is a high fixed shelf, 12k. It's fixed at 12k. A little bit of air up the top, and a 220 hertz, a bit of boost at the bottom. So it's kind of pretty much doing the same curve as on the uh, on the the Logic EQ before that. Boost at the top end, a little bit of emphasis around that higher mid there. Um, I beg your pardon. No, that's just not doing that. I'm getting 12k boost off the off the Neve, so that's quite similar to what's happening here. But then I'm boosting around here with the three 360 hertz, little bit of boost, the same as you've got here, right? And then down the bottom at 220. So I'm emphasising this boost here, the same as on the graphic, uh, on the Logic EQ, but with the Neve, which gives it more. It's just got more character. Listen to the difference when this goes in and out. Right, okay, that's bringing a bit of body back, but it's got an edge, a harmonic edge to it that that gives it a wonderful granular quality, right? And that's really giving those guitars some grind, right? So when you combine the guitars with the bass, the bass has got the gr the growl, the growling bass, which which fills in those honking mids, right? But the guitars are slightly scooped. So the growling bass fills in the mids with its own growl because the mids are missing out of the guitars. They're scooped down a bit. The growl bass fills in that mid but with a different type of mid growl to what the guitars are giving. And the bottom end of the bass gives the bottom end. So that's giving me the character of my bass and guitars. Okay, so let me let me play you a bit of that now, how that sounds. Right, okay. We've got a great grind going on now, but the best thing about that grind is this bass amp grind in the mid-range. Which is just giving it that character, right? Can you hear it in the mids? They're going... 
growl down there. Oh, that's brilliant. And you won't get that out of a guitar. Hence, I'm using the bass to give the growl in the mids, which is different to the growl you'll get from guitar mids, right? Dropping it, dropping the mids down on the guitars and filling in that dipped mid on the guitars with a growl bass. It's a totally different character now, right? It's really grinding. Okay, next thing. What else would I do? Now the kick. Oh yeah, before we get to that. Okay, so I, I added some other um, bits and bobs, which I'll come to in a sec. But then I kind of started to get a mix together and over the final channel here, I slammed another one of the T-Rex IK Multimedia emulations, which is an emulation of the classic Fairchild 670, which is a mastering compressor. It's, I'm not going to get into describing what it does now, but it, this is one of the most famous compressors in the world. It was used on nearly all the Beatles tracks. Ringo's drums used to be tracked through it and other stuff. It is used on so many commercial releases, this thing. Now, it has a quality of just doing something to the final mix, keeping it really, 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 really under control in terms of level, but allowing there to be life and energy. So it's like it clamps down, giving you real tight control over the levels. Because it's got, on this setting, it's on now, five or six. It has a very long release time. Um, but it had a very, very fast attack. So it keeps everything under control. But while it's keeping everything under control, there's life in, in, the, in the transients. So it just makes everything just come forward. It, it's, right, okay, so I'll put that on. But... The first mix I did with it on headphones um, is up on YouTube already, and you can hear when you listen to it. You know, it's mixed on headphones, so it's never it's never going to be that right to begin with. But what's what was happening in that first mix, where I put the Fairchild on, when I put this Fairchild on, right? What was happening is that the kick drum and the cymbals on the overheads were too loud, so they were pushing this compressor and causing it to to fluctuate. So I was getting kind of, not pumping, but a kind of smearing, a, a breathing almost um, from the kick and the cymbals, which was destroying, it was making the mix, it wasn't sounding, it was just wrecking the dynamics. It was making like too, it was making this thing too noticeable, right? So I thought, okay, I want the kick, up, kick drum to be really there. Um, but it's 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 if I bring it up loud enough in the mix, it's it's pushing too much. It's dominating the mix too much, and it's causing especially the final compression on the final channel to fluctuate too much and smear things around. So I went back to the kick track, tightened up the noise gate a bit. Um, the EQ I left as it was, just scooping out the mids, right? But then I used this. IK Multimedia plugin. Now this is a plugin of the famous Pultec uh, EQP1A. One of the most famous EQs ever made. It's got a low band with a boost or a cut knob and a high band with a boost or a cut knob. So you choose the band of the low and you cut by turning up the attenuation, which cuts that chosen frequency, or you turn up the boost. But the Pultec has a trick that it does which is you tune into the bottom frequency, boost and cut at the same time, and it focuses that frequency. And you cannot get this effect out of a Logic Channel EQ. There's no way. Listen to the difference when I drop it in and out. Right? Now, I went for a much deeper bass. It was originally... The, the, bass, was, uh, the bass drum bottom end was focusing you know, more around um, 80, 90, 100 hertz. Now what I'm doing is I'm focusing right in on 30 hertz, boosting it and cutting at the same time, which really focuses it on that really low 30 hertz. Then after that, it's going into this emulation of an 1176 with four to one ratio, right? Now, I've lowered it right down the bass, right? Uh, I'm giving a little bit of boost um, at 8K, at the very high end on the um, on the Fairchild, uh, the um, Pultec as well. 
So I've what I'm doing is I'm not emphasizing the bass frequencies in the kick drum around 100 hertz anymore. I'm emphasizing way, way, way lower down. And therefore, it makes the kick drum tighter. Because I can raise it up in the mix enough so I really hear it thump, but I'm not hearing thump around 60, 70, 80, 100 hertz, which was cluttering everything up and driving the final compressor too much, right? It's right, right down at the bottom end. You hear it the more you turn it up, right? And that, then lowering that, that kick drum and getting it at the right balance just makes the kick drum, you can really hear it in the mix thumping, but it no longer disturbs the compressor and makes the compressor on the output breathe at all. Right, let's take the guitars and vocals out and let, just have a listen to that um, kick drum. Can you hear it? The bottom end of the kick is now sitting underneath the bass. It's not clashing with the bass like it was before. Because this is the this is the low end bass here. Right, and we're emphasizing around 100 hertz with that. 80, 90, 100 hertz. So the real thump of the kick is down well below that now, 30 hertz, around there. Right? And it now blends in with the bass beautifully. You can hear it underneath the bass thumping away, but it's not dominating the mix anymore. Yeah, hear that? Oh, yes! You hear that? Oh, my, that is just ooh, lovely, 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 the sound of that kick now. It's it's got the, the more you turn it up, if you listen at loud listening levels, you really hear the bottom end thump. At lower levels, you still hear it, but it's not dominating the mix, right? It really isn't. And it's most importantly of all, it's not pumping this final Fairchild compressor, causing it to go up and down and, and like that, right? So the, the mix isn't pumping around anymore. Now, the next thing was the snare. The cymbals were also overloaded on the overheads, causing, again, that master Fairchild compressor on the final output to, to pump around a bit too much. So, you, so it was making the cymbals splash up and down. The cymbals were going like that. I wanted that not to happen. But this is what I'm doing. I've got the snare, the, all you've got is the snare and the overheads. There's no hi hat mic or anything. Um, and two tom mics, right? So the snare and the overheads, the snare drum was pretty weak. I didn't have any crack to it at all. Now I've, got, I've done a hell of a lot of work to try and bring some crack out of that snare drum and take away the awful boxiness it had. Right, so what I've done is tweak the gate very slightly and I'm putting on it the same EQ, so a bit of bottom end, sh shelving off, um, cutting off the bottom mud and, and just low noise, which is not part of the snare signal sound, boosting the lows, cutting tightly here on the mids to try and reduce some of that mid-range honk, and it had no top end at all, so I'm doing a massive boost up here and a shelf to try and bring back some upper edge and fizz of the snare. Okay, now after that, what I've got is a SAR 1R reverb. I love this reverb. I can't tell you how much I love this reverb. Made by Softube. It's very, very, very simple. It was a free giveaway with the Focusrite audio interface. I love this. I can't tell you how much I love this reverb, particularly for the pre-delay. So I've got the, the room sound, the room down at the smallest it can possibly be. I've got it set to bright, and I'm, but I'm, what I'm using this for is pre-delay, right? So there's a little bit of pre-delay. So when the snare hits, a split second later comes back this ba ba coming back. Look, if I turn the mix up more wet, you'll hear it. Yeah, that's just pre-delay, and that just lifts the snare out of the mix a little bit, but it doesn't sound like it's got reverb on, because you do not want that. 
Right, I'm not going for a reverb. This is a tight, dry up front track. We don't want reverb on this mix anyway. And there's virtually no reverb in this mix at all, right? So the pre delay just lifts the snare out. But we're using that very subtly. Somewhere around there. After it's gone through that reverb to get that pre delay to lift it out a bit, then I'm putting it into a Neve again the 1073 Neve, because it's got that met wonderful metallic edge to it, like, um, it's a really great emulation, this, it just that you get from hardware that you don't get from software, okay, so there's a, there's, there's sort of harmonics that are in there that give it more, it's got grit kind of thing, is the best way to describe it, um, at the more upper frequencies. So what I'm doing with this is I'm bringing back I've got it at the mid at 700 hertz, and I'm um, boosting that quite a bit, 8 dB, right? And that's just that's just bringing back. It's really subtle, but it's bringing back a little bit of mid, right? Low mid, 700 hertz. I'm going to be a minuscule boost at the fixed high shelf of 12. Okay, I'm rolling off the bottom end with this low cut at 160 hertz. That's it. I'm not doing anything else. So let me drop that low cut down lower. More, more bottom end in it now. It's subtle, but there's hardly any down there. Come back in. So this low cut is just taking out everything below 160. Not like a straight cut down, it's, it, it drops off at a slope. So, I'm, um, you know, it's taking off more of that bottom end that might be just muddying things up, right? But the amount I'm giving this is, it's what this is adding is subtle. If I drop the EQ in and out, it's very subtle, but it's more about adding that kind of harmonic edge to the to it. This just gives it that little bit of extra body with character. Okay. Right. Um, so that's my snare. After the uh, after the uh, Neve 1073, it's then going into an LA-2A again. Which just which just really brings it to life. Giving it quite a bit of hammer with that. And that's just like really giving it its dynamics back. So it's so it's got a lot of crack to it. You really it jumps out the speakers more, right? Okay. So that's the raw snare on its own. But listen to it. It still doesn't sound very good, does it? It's still quite honking. There's still a lot of on on onk in it, right? On the overheads, the snare's got more woody crack up at the top and less honk 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 in the mids. And the, all the cymbals are in that overhead pair, right? So that's where I'm getting all the cymbal and hi-hat content from, and snare, to bring back the woody edge of the snare, which is being picked up by the overheads, but not by the snare mic, which was too close to the snare when it was recorded. So it wasn't picking up the wires, the top end of the snare at all. It was too close to the skin of the drum. Common mistake, right? Um, so this pair of overheads has got more of the woody crack of the top end of the snare in it. And it's got almost none of that honk, 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 ah, 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 right? Okay, so I want some of this blended in with the, you know, the snare, because it's bringing the cymbals in, it's bringing the ambience of the kit in from, from the overhead mics, um, and ambience from the toms, and it's got the cymbals and, and what have you on it, right? So those two are blended together, and they sound like this. Right, the average just brings in more crack as well as the cymbals and everything else. Now, what I'm doing is I'm sending out a parallel mix from the drums. A little bit of kick on bus four, this is. A little bit of kick, snare, and I was sending out a parallel send from the overheads. 
and they were all going out to this compressed parallel mix group bus. All right? Which gives it grind because this is this is being heavily compressed. And then you blend that in, you blend you blend this in in parallel with the original clean and it brings you your your energy, power and glory, but you keep the cleanness of the of the clean channels. This is blended in in parallel. But the problem was when I was sending the overheads out to this group bus along with the snare and kick to make a sub mix to be to be then very heavily compressed as you hear it. There was too much symbols getting into this group bus. Right? I wanted the overheads to be quite loud in this heavily compressed group bus parallel track uh, because that's where all the cracking wooden edge of the snare is. But if I turned the feed up from the overheads going to this parallel compressed channel, then there was way too high cymbals. So they were getting massively compressed because there's a compressor on here really hammering away, right? Which is what you hear there, that heavily compressed pumping sound. Right? But the cymbals were way too loud. So they were going splashing around and pumping like mad. And when I blended it back in with the clean mix of the drums, it was just putting way too much cymbals and they were all not, not not only were the cymbals too loud but they were pumping the compressor and so the cymbals are going <laughs> pump breathing and pumping away like mad so i did something did what i did is this i needed to get the high end of those cymbals under control on the original overheads here we're giving some emphasis a little bit of emphasis to the tops and scooping out the mids right so this is kind of the natural balance of the overheads right but instead of sending them direct to the compressor group bus i sent them out on their own group bus only the overheads in stereo go to group bus nine which is here so i send out the stereo overheads on, on an auxiliary send to this channel and on this channel i EQ'd the top end out, down, reducing the symbol. So this is the feed coming from the overheads, right? Right, but I've but I've reduced the symbols down in it, right? Look, right, and. After the, um, the EQ is reducing the symbols on this, this is just a copy of the overhead uh, pair being, you know, I'm sending it out on a send, so it's arriving here as, as a submix, right? Um, which I can blend in. But what's happening is the signal's coming from the, the stereo overhead to this group bus in stereo. After the EQ, which is cutting out the, the tops, it then goes into multi compressor. And I'm heavily compressing and reducing the upper end and some of the mids, the lower mids, and leaving a little bit of crack here for the snare. So this is the overheads fed to this interim channel where I'm knocking out the cymbals and, and bringing emphasis to the crack edge of the snare. So you really that cock, 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 cock at the woody top end of the snare, but the cymbals are reduced. Then this channel is turned all the way down. So you don't hear it in the mix, right? But then I put an auxiliary send on it, pre-fade. So I just turn this up. It doesn't matter that the channel's turned right down. And I'm sending some of that EQ'd copy of the overheads. I'm sending that to the compressed group bus. So when it arrives at the compressed group bus with the kick and the snare, which are also coming to here, to be massively compressed, the cymbals have been massively reduced. So in this compressed submix now, the cymbals are way lower than if I sent the send straight from the overheads with the cymbals higher in level. Hear that now? Now in this compressed submix, you're hearing heavily compressed snare, Heavily compressed kick, a little bit less than the snare. The cymbals are in there, but they're not massively over volume compared to the snare. The cymbals are actually at the same level or slightly less than the snare now in this heavily compressed submix. That got the cymbals under control on this compressed submix. Now, just to show you then finally, on the whole compressed submix, which is 
EQ'd overheads, plus kick, plus snare. It's going into an 1176. This compressor is famous for its four buttons in technique, which gives you massive pumping compression. Right? So, the 1176 is giving it the pump. After that, it goes into the channel EQ, where I'm just notching out a little bit of um, problem I heard here at about 700 to 800 hertz. There was a little bit of honk still on the coming through from the snare and, and other things, so I just reduced it there a bit. After that, it goes into the Neve again, the 1073 Neve. And on this, I'm um, using some 3.2k boost, just to bring some edge into that. And a little bit of the 12k boost at the top. Right? And that's just giving it some brightness back. Have a listen. It's subtle, right? It's bringing that real granular harmonic edge to the crack of the of the snare, but without giving it a, a thin, nasty sound, and, and all the honk has completely gone from the snare. That honk, honk mid range. Okay. So that's my parallel compressed submix, and that, if we then get the original, let's get all the drums, solo them, there's the drum channel soloed, and then blend that, right? Right, and then blend in the compressed sub channel. Actually, this is not the best way to do it, that's not, that's not giving you it right. I'll have to mute all the other channels. Uh, mute the toms, mute the bass, mute the guitars, mute everything apart from the mute, mute. Right, this is just the kick drum, the snare, the overheads and the parallel compression I'll bring in. Right, so this is my parallel compression. Bring it in, it just just gives the drums so much more life. They come forward in the mix and really grind a bit. Hear that? But when the cymbal work comes in, it's not overdone. It's not overcooked, right? That's got my drums really nice and tight now. The snare's got some real good crack to it. All the honkiness of the snare, all the on on is gone. The cymbals are more under control. Okay. Alrighty. So then we bring in the bass to go with that. And I balance the bass. Oh, open up the group bus. Lovely upper, you know, the mid-range grind from the bass on one channel and the nice, lovely, warm um, SSL compressed and bass boosted bottom end, which is lovely and tight and warm, blended together. And I've just adjusted it so it's... The bass upper end is about level with the snare. The bass bottom end you hear it there underneath uh, everything, but it's above the kick in frequencies, and the kick is right at the bottom, thudding away, but with some click at the very top. Now I'm doing something else. I'm sending another send out only from the snare channel, a little bit of it to this channel here. Now this is another parallel feed from the snare and on it I've put <laughs> this free this is an Ibanez tube screamer pedal emulation that's free from TSE very good get it it's called the TSE 808 right if you're into metal guitars the tube street screamer is, is a you know probably the most famous um, overdrive pedal so I've got a parallel feed coming into here of the snare 
and I'm overdriving it with this pedal. With the tone set in a particular way. So it's got that, that's the grind. So this is a really distorted snare. After that, it's going into the 1176 again with the all buttons in to make it really hammer. Right? And then after the 1176, it's going into the graphic, the API graphic again. And I'm doing this shape. So I'm emphasizing the tops, scooping out the mid around there to reduce honk even more on, on this parallel feed because it's coming straight from the snare only channel, which had a lot of honk. Um, this is the curve I've got. Hear that? Bringing in the distortion on this is really emphasizing that oh, 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 mid range. So it's ringing like a bell. This cuts it out. And then this distorted snare, a smidge of it, a tiny bit of it is being blended in with the drum mix. But I've panned it to the right. It's so subtle in the mix that you hardly hear it. But it's panned to the right, whereas the, the snare itself is panned straight centre, which just has an effect of, and it's a really an acoustic sort of anomaly. You, heart, you don't really hear this distorted snare. It's in there. But it's just kind of adding a spread almost to the snare. So off to this side slightly, your brain perceives there's a bit of grind, but it doesn't really hear it. It's just blending so subtle, but it just adds a little something, right? Bring it back in notice that you just hear some because this is picking up hi-hats as well right on the snare channel and the fizz of the snare is being emphasized by the distortion pedal which is also making the hi-hats that that mic is picking up fizz so when you bring this up you hear hi-hats fizz as well as the snare grind distorted Drop it out and the snare becomes a bit more woody. Bring this in and you hear the that high-end fizz of both the top of the snare and the hi-hat. It is subtle though, right? But there it is. Right, and that's my drums and bass balanced. The next thing, the guitars have explained what's happening with them already, I think, didn't I? Did I or did I not? No. Yeah, I did. One's got the graphic on, so it's mid-rangey. The other's more scooped. Pan left and right, going to their own group bus. Um, and on the group bus, there's this EQ curve going on. After that, it goes into the... Uh, oh, no, first it goes into the LA-2A, which is giving that real edge to the guitars, right? the difference this makes it's hammering down the guitars keeping them really under control but listen to the grind it's giving to them that edge that lovely harmonic edge okay right and then after that it goes into the neve where i'm just doing a little bit of tweak on it tiny bit of tweak just a little 12k air and a little bit of mid boost 360 hertz and a little bit of 220 at the bottom end to bring back some mid warmth and a little bit of sheen up the top okay this might even be a little bit bright. I could even drop the top end a smidge. Okay. There's my guitars. And then they are blended in. Balanced, not too high, so that they're just high enough to, to provide the, the, the spread of the guitar across the speakers, but not so high that they mask the growling electric bass there. You hear that growl in the mid-range from the electric bass uh, with the distortion, and then the bottom bass brings in the bottom. Okay, let's look at the last uh, The toms, the toms, I am using some SAR-1R reverb on that. Again, just to give pre-delay on the tom fills, right? Just to bring them out a smidge. 
and they are being sent also a little bit of them is being sent to that parallel compressed bus with everything else so a little bit of parallel compression happens on the toms as well uh, but i'm limiting the toms with a limiter before the reverb so first there's a channel compressor keeping them under control just the logic one then there's eq scooping out the mids giving them some high-end bite so they they got the scooped out mid sort of thud sound right then I'm limiting the crap out of them so they cannot go above a certain level. They, they are absolutely pegs. So they cannot overload. Then they go through the reverb and then into the mix. And a little bit of parallel feeds going out to the compressed submix to give them some um, grind there. And they're adjusted so that you hear the toms, but they're not too loud. hear the toms why are they not playing because i'm muted on the bloody track here on their own channels right here they are here's the toms let's hear it around that bit where there's a, a fill <laughs> hear that <laughs> so they got real thud to them now Real, real thud. Absolutely pegged with the limiter. So they just come in at full volume almost and that's where they stay. So we get a really big thud off them. And I'm sending out from the send here to the group bus to add that parallel compression to them on this group bus parallel compression. Which gives them that little extra, right? Look, if I mute the drum channels, we should just be able to hear... You hear that? This the parallel compression on the toms is giving them that little extra as well, right? So they're nice and thudding and dry as a bone. So you hear them, and they're they're balanced in the mix. So you just hear them go 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 when the guy does a fill, but they're not like too high. This sounds a little bit mid-range, this mix, to me in speakers, in headphones now, but I did, I balanced this on speakers today, uh, and it's on speakers, it's it's not, it's got a little more bottom end, but let me press my headphones into my ears and hear it. Yeah, if you've got headphones on, just push them against your ears a bit, which emphasises the bass, and you'll hear the balance. Right, it's got lovely bottom end warmth, but all that, that huffing and puffing that was being caused by the kick and the and the, the symbols in the overheads just splashing away going ksh, 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 ksh. that's gone they're they're under control it's tight there's a good crack to the snare everything like that and it's just a matter of i might change the balance of the guitars relative to the bass i might change the amount of growl bring it up a bit it's not finished yet right <laughs> well, whatever happens in terms of the balance between the bass and the guitar I do not want the guitars up so loud that they mask that growl off the bass amp. You know, where I've put the amp on the growling um, graphic mids, right? That is going to be my middle growl. Really important, therefore, that when you listen to the bass and guitars only together, you can hear that growl from the mids of the bass and the guitars are not too loud masking it. Right, okay. Now, the electric guitar solo, it was a bit dull, and then when I did a remix, I put the Neve on it, which not just because it will give the EQ, but it puts a, a, that, that Neve hardware, slightly sort of metallic, harmonically rich edge to it, and I'm just boosting the guitars a little bit, a few dB at 1.6K, and a tiny smidge of air at the top, that's all. Right? But it's having this effect. Um, on the um, lead guitar, this is, right? When the lead guitar solo comes in. Now, I did have more mid on it. I was boosting the mids more. At 3.2k originally, right? But every time I heard the solo come in, I thought, that's too loud. It's got too much top end. 
first I put the top end on it, it was actually higher up here at 3.2k because I, every time the solo came in, it I wanted it low down in the mix. I don't want the solo jumping out. I want it to be low in the mix, but you should be able to hear it, right? I don't want it to dominate when it comes in. I just want it to be there, really blended in. It's sitting inside the whole song. But it was dull at the top end, so I put more top end boost on it. And then every time I heard it, I thought, no, it's too bright, it's too bright. So I switched to here with a little less boost. And that just made it not as trebly. So when the lead guitar comes in, it's not too trebly. It's panned very slightly to the right. <laughs> It's not too bright, but you hear it cut through. And um, it's got a stereo delay on it. You can hear the delay. <laughs> hear that delay? You hardly notice it in the mix, but it's adding a nice bounce back, which which your ears perceive, but you don't hear it like super up front. Right? And that's the only, the only thing that's got any echo on it, really. Everything else is dry in the mix, right? Um, so yeah, electric lead guitar, flat EQ, didn't do anything with the EQ on the channel EQ, just the low cut, then it goes into the stereo delay and then into the Neve to give it some edge, a subtle amount of edge, and it sat down in the mix just so it doesn't dominate when it comes in. You hear it but it doesn't dominate at all, it's sitting beautifully in the mix or riding in the mix, right? <laughs> guitars just right so they're not too loud and you really start to that growl of that mid-range bass channel the guitars are more adding the frosting at the top and some grind down at the bottom right but above the frequencies of the very low bass which comes in at the bottom just really just pegging away with lovely super control warmth from that SSL compressor channel compressor right that just leaves the vocal the two vocals nothing on the EQ man absolutely I've, I'm treated they're just coming off their channel absolutely as they were recorded the only thing is each one has a low cut because there's nothing in the vocal above 50 Hertz 60 Hertz on the mic um, so the bottom any bottom is just gonna be noise and, and low noise so we don't want that so I'll cut that out it's a double track vocal all right both panned absolutely center, both at pretty much the same level. And so exactly level together. And they go to their own group bus. Where is it? Vocal bus. Here it is. Now on the vocal bus. Let's find some vocal. Here we go. On the vocal bus. Daisy, daisy, please don't leave me now. I've got a noise gate just to cut out noise. It's It's got a nice, not too tight. You know, the release is not too fast and some hold as well. So every time the vocal happens, it opens up quick. So you catch all the attack trans into the vocal, but it closes nicely, not sort of close really quick, right? Daisy, daisy, please don't leave me now. Um, so after the gate, it's going into the Neve. I think I started with the preset some fresh air. It's I've got some this is a fixed 12k high shelf. About 5 dB of boost on that to give it some air at the top of the vocals and a tiny tiny bit just a couple of dB of boost at 4.8k. I like to bring some vocal edge the all the higher treble in the vocal which is the sounds the upper end sounds um you know made by the the, the tongue and the lips just a little tiny bit of emphasis on that it's been a long time coming but i can't have love which, uh, the quality of the need just 
brings that out, a brightness to the vocal, but without harshness, right? Okay. After that, then it's going into this plugin, and I can't tell you how much I love this one. This is another one of the T-Rex plugins. Um, ha, this is a copy of an Echo Plex, which is a classic, famous tape Echo. Now, listening to the, the, the vocal in isolation, it sounds like there's quite a lot of echo on it. Yeah, there is, when you listen to it in isolation. I've got a quarter, I've put the um, echo to sync, and I've set the echo time to a quarter beat. And then I've hardly got any, the sustain here is the feedback, so there's hardly any feedback. And then you. Yeah. yeah, you really hear just one repeat and it dies away. And it's mixed not very high. Right? So there's not too much echo relative to the dry signal. Spent a long time But the thing is, the secret of what I'm doing here is I'm not using this echoplex as a send and return effect, adding the the the, the tape echo in with the original clean signal coming from the channel. I'm putting the vocal directly through the echoplex, which is changing the EQ of the vocal as well as adding the echo. Come in, but I can't help loving you. Days and days, and please don't leave me now. It has the effect of dulling it down, which is why I've added that extra bit of boost on the treble with the neve. Yeah, not much, but just enough, right? Okay. Now it sounds like a lot of echo, but when you hear it in the mix, you hear the echo coming back either side and it just because the the vocal is nicely down in the mix i don't want it like up front dominating the mix right but you want to hear all the lyrics that the vocalist is singing so that i've set the vocal so it's sitting right inside the mix right and even if, if you're listening on headphones you're listening in front of the speakers or even if you're listening in the other room through a door you hear the vocal you can hear the lyrics and the echo once you put the vocal into the mix, that echo sounds less loud, but you do hear it, which gives it a spooky quality. You hear these echoes coming back on the left and right after the vocal. Have a listen. Right, hear that? I could even just lower the level a little bit. I've got the level up more on the left than the right. That's deliberate. I want there to be less echo on one side than the other. Let's just lower the left a little bit. So, so when you hear the echoes and they're incredibly subtle in the mix, you hear there's a little bit more echo on the left than the right. Yeah, let's lower that one even a bit more down. Right, so that the left the echo is a little bit more on the left than the right giving giving a, a, a nice kind of impression of of like the echoes coming out of a space and one side of it on your ears got a little bit more echo than the other side right now let's hear that but that echo coming back with the tone that it's got is just making the vocal sound ghostly almost, right? And then what I did is I don't like the echo in the bits where the vocalist drops out the vocal here. Stay another night. So originally I was dropping the echo in and out manually by clicking the on off switch, but I, used, I added some automation. I made a track for the vocal bus and then which has got the effects including the tape on it, the tape echo on it, and I just bypassed the tape echo Every time the music drops out and the singer sings that phrase, stay uh, another night. And there you get real dry, bratty, you know, there's nothing, um, you know, clean, dry, no effects and more trebly because the tape's being dropped out. Right. Thank you. Stay another night. So when the echo drops out. So we hear the clean vocal phrase there from both vocals, the, the vocals get more treble at that point. And they get a little bit louder, so they up there as you know they don't so, when the music disappears and the vocals are just there going stay another night they don't sound lower. 
not like, oh, there's a gap and the vocals are doing that phrase, but they've dropped down in level compared to the level I was listening to the track at. These are actually louder than they are when they're in the rest of the song before the break because of the drop out of the echo, the tape echo. And then I've done that across the whole song. Every time there's the drop out, stay another night. Here, here and here, I've dropped the echo out on the automation, so I ain't got to do it manually. Oh yeah, one more thing. At the beginning of the song, it comes from this... The low bass and the high bass, because remember there's um, two tracks for the bass, right? And one's doing the growl and one's doing the deep bass. Well, if I let the the deep bass do the... It was all muddy and just a mess. So for the diddle 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 intro, only the growl bass is working and the deep bass only comes in on the very first kick drum when the beat of the song comes in. So all through the diddle 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 roll intro, where the drummer's doing the roll and the snare, this is just the growl bass. As soon as the first kick comes in, then the deep bass comes in. <laughs> Now, when I'm listening to this, I don't hear any more pumping artifacts. The cymbals are not splashing and huffing and puffing like they were before, which was really, you know, it just wasn't right. It just wasn't right at all. Now, when you hear the cymbals, I might do some more work on it because, you know, I'll have to check and check again to make sure they're still not too loud, right? But there's no more pumping from the kick, no more pumping from the cymbals, and the kick is deeply under the bass now with that pull tech at 30 hertz. So you really hear the thump of the bass. The bass, the low bass is above the kick um, and the growl is there and there's no more splashing around. It's it's nearly done now. I don't want to tweak it now on headphones too much at all because I'm going to listen on speakers and do further tweaks. But it's pretty much there now, all right? I'm trying to go for a modern, What I'm gone, what I've gone for is a modern equivalent of a classic old British sound, you know? Um, so hence the growl from the bass to fill in the mids.
the night And um, incidentally, at the end, when everything cuts out and the guitars sustain away, you can really hear that growl bass going. It's brilliant. I love that. That was one thing. The vocal bus. I've just thought of this, actually. The vocal bus. Um, on the vocals themselves, no compression on their channels. On the group bus, no compression. There's a compressor on there at the end of the chain. There's a gate just to shut down the, 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 the group bus when there's no vocals, followed by the neve to give it that edge, and then the tape. And the neve is to compensate for the t treble taken away by the tape echo. But then there's a compressor on here. Now, it's not being used, right? The vocals, no, no, it's not activating. Daisy, daisy, or hardly at all. But I've just thought of this. I'm going to finally put the vocals, and you know what, I'm going to go back to that tape and just lower the left side a little bit. It's, I'm hearing it too much now. So the left and right are the same now, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so of that compressor, I'm going to put the LA-2A, right? These IK multimedia plugins, I'm telling you, man, they are so, so bloody good. I mean, the SSLs, I'm going to do a full review of these, right, and really show you them. And I'm going to show you them in the EQ tutorials. But, oh, my God, they're so on the money. I mean, I've got the soft tube emulations of the 4000 and the 9000 SSL channel strips, and those are endorsed and authorised by SSL. So they work with SSL to get them absolutely spot on. And I'm telling you, these two IK multimedia SSLs, you get the white 9000K channel strip, and you get the... 4000 channel strip which you can switch between the E or the G revision um, the black or brown knob right and they're on the money man I'm telling you they're as good as those soft tube ones they really are uh, anyway the thing about was the white 2A the LA 2A let's put that on the vocal is there a vocal preset Let's try hard compression on this vocal. Now, the LA-2A has a certain character on vocals. Let's just see what that does. Daisy, daisy, please don't leave me now. Daisy, daisy, please don't leave me now. It's been a long time coming, but I can't help loving you. Daisy, daisy, please don't leave me without the echo uh, uh. and I know that it's not right and there's nothing I can say to make you stay another night I'll, I'll tweak this further but it's adding a grab at the beginning of each vocal attack it's it's giving this it's grab effect right let's see it let's see it with that in the mix just the last bit here let's hear that Did you hear it there on the butt? It really grabbed that butt and made it really, well, grabbed like the, oh, just, just listen to that when he sings the word bud eye and that compressor attacks and you know that bud eye, right? Yeah, it's brilliant, yeah? I'll tweak this further. This is based on the Teletronics LA-2A, right? Which was an um, optical and valve compressor, I believe. I think I've got that right. 
it there's no attack, there's no release or any gain or or threshold or gain reduction. I think you just drive it, you drive it, you drive it, and you get more and more ratio and more and more compression. But it has a character. Let's just I think let's just hear that again. Could be doing it. That could be the one. It maybe needs a bit of body back in the vocal now. <sighs> no, I'll leave that alone. I'm not going to mess too much because I'm not on speakers. But that's something I could do. I could put that white compressor in on the vocal. All right. Okay. So there, there you go. That's that's what I've done to it so far. Okay. Uh, more tutorials to come. This is pretty much the mix now. I'm going to mess with it more, but only on speakers. Little tweaks, because when you get to this stage of the mix, to get to this stage of the mix, I set these things up, some of them corrective, like dropping the kick drum frequency down so it wasn't booming and it was sitting under the bass, tightening up the bass bottom end, getting that growl on the mid of the bass, all these kind of things, um, working on the snare more, particularly the parallel channel, making sure the overheads had the cymbals reduced so when they're fed into the pumping parallel channel the cymbals aren't splashing and hoofing and huffing around right all those kind of things and but when it came to the balancing of levels i just little tweak have a listen little tweak have a listen and, and now you're at this stage you just play it back on speakers not too loud at first have a listen notice anything okay turn it up a bit now and have a listen but don't have, don't listen at loud volume a lot Bring it back down, listen, and then every so often turn it up, listen to it aloud for 30 seconds to a minute, go out the room, listen to it coming out the other, out the door. Do you notice, can you hear the vocal still? Can you hear the words? Right, okay. Is the vocal too high? Come back, drop it down a bit, maybe whatever. Little tweaks you do now. You just do little tweaks and leave it and get used to that tweak. And then, yeah, maybe the vocal should drop a smidge. Drop the vocal and leave it. Listen. Stop listening. Don't listen consistently all the time. Stop listening. Go and make some coffee. Come back. Have another listen. Listen outside the room with the sound coming out of the room. How's the vocal? Yeah. No, I think I lowered it too much. Whatever. You just do the tiny tweaks. And you little by and that's that's your final bit to get it, right? But this is the stage you're at now, okay? All the pumping and hoofing and huffing from the cymbal and the bass and the kick drum has gone away. It's sounding much more controlled now, but we've still got a good crack to the snare, which had a revolting tone in the original multi-track channels. I've had to work on that hugely. Um, yeah, there it is. I, I really love this song. I'm starting to think now maybe it needs some of the middle instrumental playing taken out to reduce its overall oh, pardon me, time. Um, it is in length, in time, it is 3 minutes 38. I'm thinking about cutting out some of the instrumental playing, either before the solo or after the solo, or maybe both, to reduce it down to 3 minutes, or just over 3 minutes, to make it even shorter, because it's a, it's a classic old-school punk song, right? You could have a punk disco going on and be playing a mixture of stuff, more modern stuff and more old classic British or American stuff, and you could drop this into the mix, uh, into your DJ set, and it would work. You know, people, if they never, they'd be going, oh, oh, I've not heard that track before, but it really works in that genre. And it's got a fast enough pace to get keep people on the dance floor, right? That's really important. And I actually think it's a classic track. But because of that, the old British punk songs would come in and in, hit them hard, and then go away. They were never really more than two and a half minutes. And the secret of it was you come in, you hit them hard, and you get the fuck out. Pardon my French, right? So that at the end of the song, the person goes, holy shit, it's over already. Let me play that again. Oh, it's over already. Let me play it again. You want to play it again and again and again and again. It doesn't go on so long that you start thinking, okay, I've heard that song now. Get in, hit them hard, and get the F out. So I'm thinking of maybe doing some more chopping, where I chop chunks of the song out and shorten it. But we'll come to that. I'll get the mix exactly right. Right, and then I will 
save a copy as, and then I'll look at maybe chopping some sections of the song out. Another thing I'm thinking of doing is instead of having the intro, I'm thinking of just coming straight in with the vocal. So the first thing you hear is the singer singing, Daisy, Daisy, it just comes straight in on the vocal. There's no intro at all. Just one, two, three, four. And as soon as he sings the word Daisy, that's when the music comes in. Um, maybe something like that. But these are all editing decisions. That's where I'm putting on my producer record company hat there. If there's someone brought me this in a label or as a producer before they'd got to record it and, and mix it, just the demo recordings, like this is the song, we're going to go into the studio and do it more properly. Uh, that's where you'd be looking at the arrangement and going, look, guys, have you considered taking out the playing between this ver uh, chorus and the guitar solo? Like we come out of the chorus straight into the guitar solo, or we come out of the guitar solo straight into the last verse. We don't have this bit of instrumental playing here and here, or one of them goes, or whatever, right? You know what I mean? There's all sorts of ways... And you could end it just with stay another night and it just ends on the on the snare and and everything and everything cuts out at that point instead of letting it decay and sustain away. There's lots of things you can do in terms of producing the arrangement, all right? But that's something we're gonna to get to in a in, in a further tutorial. So there it is. Yeah, I, I'm starting to really like this song, and I'm telling you what, this is a classic punk song, man. It really is. This would stand up with anything from the old days. It's got a beautifully catchy lyric, really good. Daisy, Daisy. You, you can sing along with it. It's got you can dance to it. This is really, really important. I'm going to go on a little bit here, but you know you want to learn this stuff, producing and arranging and all that, right? Um, rock music. It. What I like is tracks that. This sounds a bit sexist, maybe, in the modern era we, we live in, but here's the thing. You go to a rock disco. I don't know if you've ever been to a rock disco, right, where they play rock tracks. They might play a little bit of hip-hop rock crossover now and again, or it might just be straight old punk or, or garage stuff, right? But look at the tracks that get the girls on the dance floor. Now, if you go back to the really early days, before you were born, most of you listening to this, what would get people up on the dance floor? Rock tracks, yeah, they, they've they got to have a certain speed and a certain groove, that, and, and you get the girls up on the dance floor, the boys will get up on the dance floor. <laughs> now, what I'm saying might sound sexist, as I say, in this politically correct age we live in now, but boys are shy of dancing, so it's not sexist. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, <laughs> I'm saying this for a reason. Boys... Particularly rock boys, they don't like you know dancing. Oh, that's a bit. That's what people who are into club music do. You know, dancing on the dance floor to rock songs. But you get the girls up, and the boys will get on the dance floor as well. But the girls have got to lead the way because the boys won't get up on their own, unless it's some local nutter. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you know, you go to the old days. This is what made the Rolling Stones so huge. Not just because they wrote fantastic songs. I'm just going to wax lyrical a little bit here because you want to learn about this mixing, engineering, and producing, right? The Rolling Stones, you, you do a classic rock disco, Stones tracks get people up on the dance floor, particularly the girls, and you get the girls up and the boys follow, right? Why? Because the secret that a lot of people never talk about with the Rolling Stones is Bill Wyman's bass, right? You listen to Stones tracks, the early stuff, you know, Brown Sugar, all those kind of tracks, right? The bass on Rolling Stones tracks is groovy. It's so, so dancey and groovy. Bill Wyman's bass was just... And, and everyone just talks about Keith all the time. Keith, the riff master. Don't get me wrong, I've met Keith Richards, right? Um, and he's a legend. And his riffs, simple, iconic, the greatest riff master in history, Right? But everyone talks about Keith and Mick. Keith and Mick. Charlie Watts is quoted, isn't he, often as saying, well, I don't know about the Stones. I mean, it's Keith and Mick's band, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, Charlie just lives down the road from me on, on the river. Um, or one of his homes, anyway, is just down the road. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I live in Chelsea, by the way. Um, so, that's what it was with the Stones. 
Bill Wyman, his bass lines, man, was so groovy. Check out early Stones tracks and listen to that bass because it's the bass that makes them so danceable, right? And that's what gets people on the dance floor. So this has got, it really, this would get people on the dance floor, man. It's got the pace, the tempo, everything like that. This would fit into a punk, old school and modern disco just right. Drop this in the mix, into your DJ mix and people get up. And I, I think, I actually think this is, a classic bloody track, I do. It's really, really growing on me, man. Like, back in the old days when you listened, used to listen to John Peel. This is, again, before most of you were born, right, in the 70s. John Peel. Um, if this came on, everyone would be talking about it the next day and going out and buying it. I'm telling you, this is a killer track. It really is. <laughs> The only one thing I can notice straight away that's happening, I've put that LA-2A on the vocal, but it's boosting the echo. So let's put it before the echo and see what happens. Better, now the echo isn't too loud. Right. Killer track, man. A killer track, I'm telling you. This should be released. It really should. Okay, so, Daisy Daisy. This is, we're getting to the end of it now, the final mix, but there is these producer things I might do of chopping the length of the song, things like that, but we'll come to that, okay? Hope you find this interesting. Um, once I will talk to you about this more soon.